Kwaku was walking along the road near his village. The sun shone brightly overhead and the sweat poured off his face. He mopped his brow as he trudged along the road. The longer he walked, the heavier his load became. He had started the morning calling out his services to anyone who would listen. But it seemed no one needed their shoes repaired today. Just then, Jomo passed Kweku on the road. Jomo was riding a bright blue bicycle, pedaling fast as the breeze blew through his hair. If only I had a bicycle like Jomo, Kweku thought, then all my problems would be solved. I wouldn't have to walk along this road and the breeze would blow through my hair and keep me cool too. Jomo pedaled hard, letting the anger inside of him push the bicycle forward. This was his third trip to the village. It seemed his uncle couldn't remember anything, and so he kept sending the boy back home to collect something. First, it was his mobile phone, which his uncle had left on the table in his house. Then it was a tool he forgot. Now it was some document he needed. Didn't his uncle appreciate how hard it was to ride a bicycle back and forth all day? Ha! Huh. Jomo was sure his uncle had never ridden a bicycle in his life. He vowed that one day when he was rich, he would never ride a bicycle again. Just then, Patrick sped by Jomo on a motorbike, blowing his horn. Jomo had to turn his bicycle suddenly and nearly fell off into the ditch. That's what I need, Jomo thought to himself. If only I had a motorbike, then my problems would be over. I wouldn't have to ride this bicycle back and forth. I could make the journey in a fraction of the time. Patrick barely noticed as he sped past Jomo, racing to the city. Patrick's mind was focused on only one thing, getting to the hospital on time. His mother lay in a coma and his sister had urged him to hurry. He had to see her one more time. He had to tell her. He had to tell her he was sorry for what he'd done. He had not meant to say the things he did or to hurt her so, but the pressures of his new business had been so great, and she seemed not to notice how hard he worked. She was always criticizing him. She never appreciated his efforts to pay the school fees for his sister. It had finally become too much for him, and he'd lashed out at his mom in a fit of frustration. Just then, a big Mercedes-Benz saloon car overtook Patrick on his motorbike. If only a, I had a car like that, Patrick thought to himself. One day, I'll get such a car. One day, I'll prove to my family how hard I work, how successful I've been. One day, his thoughts trailed off as the car sped off into the distance. Mr. Lamote sat in the back seat of his big Mercedes-Benz saloon car, deep in thought as his driver navigated the road to his village. Just a few months left, the doctor had said, maybe just weeks. The cancer had spread and there was nothing they could do. So Lomote was on his way to his village to wait. He would stay there till the end, saying goodbye, making plans for his family. Just then, Lamote's car passed Kweku walking along the road. Ah, Lamote thought, if only I could be a boy again, a young boy just like him, walking along the road. Look at him, not a care in the world with all the time on his hands. If I could just be like that boy, walking on the road casually, no hurries, no worries, no cancer, no bills, no family to pull me and push me. If only I could be a boy again, walking along the road. So Kweku envied Jomo's bicycle, and Jomo envied Patrick's motorbike, and Patrick envied Lamote's Mercedes-Benz saloon car, and Lamote wished he could be just like Kweku, walking along the road with his whole life ahead of him. All four men envied one another, but none of them had any joy. Where does joy come from? What brings us happiness? Is it a bicycle or a motorbike or a shiny Mercedes-Benz saloon car? Is it health or wealth or family or success? Is it a holiday or a special gift? Sadly, most people don't know. We keep seeking joy in outward circumstances. We seek it in possessions and in appearances, but joy doesn't come from outward circumstances. We often think that a change of scenery will improve our view, but no matter what pasture we move to, the grass always seems greener on the other side of the fence. 
And joy doesn't come from what we acquire. You see, the problem is even when we get something good in our lives, we automatically want more. We want the next bigger one, the next best thing, the newest model. We're just like the rich man who was once asked, how much money does it take to be happy? His answer, just a little bit more than whatever I have now. You see, we all want joy, but joy doesn't come from what we might think. The problem is we're looking for joy in the wrong places. So where does joy come from? Well, that's our quest today as we begin our new sermon series titled Joy to the World. We're going to begin by discovering the true source of joy in the Christmas story. And in the process, we'll learn how to keep that joy all year long. But before we find out how... Let's bow our heads and pray. Almighty and everlasting Father, we thank you that you, you alone have the answer to the longing of our heart. You are the one who knows how to bring us joy that remains. So today I pray that you will strip away every wrong idea, every thought of the flesh. I pray you'll deny us every deception of the devil and that you'll give us the truth of how we can find joy that remains. We submit to you now, I bind every voice of the enemy that would come to deceive or disturb or distract us. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I loose the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that you might speak to our hearts, enlighten our minds, and give us the grace to embrace your truth and obey your word. We thank you by faith now, in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. I want to invite you to take a moment, join your faith with mine, put your hand on your chest and pray after me, Lord Jesus, speak to my heart, change my life, manifest your glory in me, in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen and amen. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to today's broadcast. It's great to have you here with me as we launch our Christmas sermon series titled, Joy to the World. Throughout the rest of this month of December, we're going to learn what the Bible teaches about joy, where it comes from, how to get it, and how to keep it. And we begin today with our scripture text taken from the Christmas story found in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. Now, receive the word of the Lord. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring Great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. May the Lord bless the reading of his word to your heart today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Take a moment with me today and think about what the Bible is telling us in these verses. You may have heard the Christmas story over and over, but today I want you to think about the situation these shepherds faced. This certainly doesn't seem to be a joyful occasion. There was nothing in the natural realm that would cause these shepherds to be joyful. There they were, out in the field with the sheep. I mean, that's not very exciting. Watching sheep is not going to make most people happy. And it was at night. The shepherds had to stay up all night outside watching sheep sleep. Hey! Yet into the midst of this very ordinary and boring circumstance, suddenly there was good news. Suddenly angels came to the shepherds and proclaimed news that would bring joy, great joy, not only to the shepherds, but to everybody everywhere. And in this story, we begin to learn the source of joy. The angels proclaimed a message of joy, not because of the current situation the shepherds were in, but because of something far deeper and far greater. The angels gave the shepherds the key to understanding the source of joy, and in their story, we learn the truth as well. So today, let me give you three truths about the source of joy from the Christmas story. And here's your first truth today. Joy is relational, not circumstantial. See, the first thing we learn from the Christmas story is that joy is relational. It comes from relationship. When the angels came to proclaim good news of great joy, it was centered around a person, the Savior, Jesus Christ. Listen again to their words in Luke 2, 10 and 11. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. 
So you see, it was the person of Jesus that brought joy because joy is relational. Joy comes from knowing God. That's why Acts 2.28 says, you will fill me with joy in your presence. And when your joy comes from a relationship with God, that means you can never lose your joy as long as you stay close to Jesus. No matter what comes your way, you can rejoice with greater joy because you have Jesus in you. The problem most of us have today is that we're searching for happiness instead of joy. Happiness and joy are not the same thing. Happiness is based on circumstances, and you can't always control circumstances. In fact, the English word happiness actually comes from the Latin word hap, which means circumstance or luck. It's where we get the word happenstance. And you see, happiness is a feeling, and feelings come and go. But joy is a deep and abiding presence in the life of the Christian. In fact, joy is a mark of the Christian life. If you don't have joy deep in your heart, something is wrong. That doesn't mean you'll always feel happy. It doesn't mean you'll always feel good. Joy is deeper and richer than that. Joy rises above it all. Joy abides in our souls even when darkness surrounds our situation. And that's why joy is the sign of the New Testament church. In the days of the early church, people wanted to join the church because of the joy the people had. When the church was persecuted, they had joy. When they gave to the poor, they had joy. When they sacrificed, they had joy. And the world around them began to say, who are these people that they can be joyful even in the midst of trials? And the Apostle Paul is a great example of this joy that supersedes all situations in life. He was in prison, chained to a Roman guard when he wrote the book of Philippians. Yet he talked about joy 17 times in the book of Philippians. It's in this book that he wrote, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. How could Paul do that? How could he rejoice in prison? How could he have joy in a very unjoyful place we need to know because you see all of us have trials the rich have trials the poor have trials the walker the bicycle rider the motorbike rider the car driver they all have trials both happy and sad people experience trials everyone has difficulties and one cannot pass through life without experiencing trials no one is happy all the time and what we need is a way through the trials. And that's what God gives us, joy in the midst of trials. That's why the Bible tells us in James 1, 2, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. In other words, troubles are going to come, but you can have true joy, deep joy, no matter what is happening around you. See, if you believe happiness is an event, then you'll think, I'll be happy when I get a car. I'll be happy when I get married. I'll be happy when I get a child. I'll be happy when I get a new job, when I get to America, when I get my own home, when I get to do whatever I want. But you can have all those things and lack joy. And you can lack all those things and have joy. So here's the truth you need to pack up and take home with you today. Do not allow what you don't have to keep you from enjoying what you do have. That's the truth we can learn from the amazing life story of a man from Australia named Nick Vujicic. Nick was born in 1982 without any arms or legs. When the nurse brought Nick to his mother, she refused to see him or hold him. Eventually, his parents had to accept their son, and they chose to believe that God had a purpose in it. But as Nick grew up, he was bullied and tormented by other children. He was so miserable that Nick attempted suicide when he was just 10 years of age. Yet in spite of the overwhelming challenges he faced, both physically and emotionally, Nick found strength and purpose for his life in Jesus. He dedicated his life to Christ at the age of 15 and began ministering hope to other people. Nick refused to allow what he didn't have to keep him from enjoying what he did have. So he set out to live life to its fullest. Even though he has no arms or legs, Nick started surfing and playing football. 
In 2013, Nick even got married, and he and his wife now have two children. Today, Nick travels around the world preaching the joyful news of Jesus. Through his testimony, millions of people around the globe have seen firsthand that joy doesn't come from circumstances. Joy comes from God because joy is relational, not circumstantial. That's what Nick Bujicic knows, and that's what the New Testament church knew. For Hebrews 10, 34 tells us, you suffered along with those who were thrown into jail, and when all you owned was taken from you, you accepted it with joy. You knew there were better things waiting for you that will last forever. And friend, when you know your joy is not based on earthly circumstances, you can rejoice in all things. When you know your joy is based in God, you can rejoice at all times. And that brings us to the second source of joy. Joy comes by choice, not by chance. You see, when the news of joy came to the shepherds, they had a choice. They could believe it and receive it, or they could doubt it and remain unchanged. But listen to what happens in Luke 2, 15. The shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. In other words, they chose to accept the news and receive the word with faith. And in that fact, we learn the second source of joy. Joy doesn't come by chance. Joy doesn't just come to people by luck. The fact is, joy is a choice. It was a choice for Mary and Joseph. When God changed their plans, they had to choose, will we be joyful or sad? It was a choice for the wise men. When they saw the star, they had to choose, should we follow it or forget it? It was especially a choice for the shepherds. Would they believe or doubt? And you see, joy is a choice for you as well. So the question you have to ask yourself today is this, how? How do I choose joy? For the fact is, joy is not automatic. Even people who've been believers for a long time, even people who've attended church a lot, realize that you don't automatically become joyful. You don't become joyful just by reading your Bible or praying more or even coming to church. There are choices you can make that will produce joy in your life. And the first choice you can make that will produce joy is to focus on God's goodness. That's why Psalms 103, 2 to 5 says, praise the Lord, my soul. Forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. You see, David's gratitude and praise began by recognizing the good in his life. David had sin, but he recognized God's goodness in forgiving him. David had disease, but he recognized God's goodness in healing him. He'd been in the pit, but he recognized God's goodness in delivering him. He had many desires in life, but he recognized the good even in those desires when God satisfied him. He focused on his Father in heaven, not the problem at hand. And that's where so many of us go wrong. We lack joy because we focus on the problem at hand rather than our Father in heaven. We get frustrated and fearful because we only see the negative. But if you'll remember God's benefits, if you'll learn to recognize the good, then you'll be grateful for all that he's done. You'll see his hand of good in every situation. You'll rise up in faith and believe that God is working all things for your good. And when you recognize the good, you'll be grateful. And gratitude brings a joy that nothing in this world can give. In fact, David said in Psalm 4, 7, You have given me greater joy than those who have abundant harvests of grain and new wine. So here's the truth you need to pack up and take home with you today. Your joy is not based on circumstances, it's based in God. The closer you get to God, the greater your joy. And the way to get close to God is to let gratitude fill your life. When you make praise your garment, the presence of God will fill your life. That's why joyful people don't become grateful. Grateful people become joyful. 
An ungrateful person can never be happy. Some of the richest people in the world are the unhappiest because they're ungrateful for all the good they have. Yet every grateful person finds joy. When you can look at your circumstances with gratitude to God, joy will be your portion. That's the lesson we can learn from Pastor Sunday Gomna from Nigeria. Several years ago, the Nigerian city of Jos was the scene of violent clashes between Muslims and Christians. Muslims burnt churches and killed pastors, and many Christians retaliated with revenge. But in the midst of the destruction, true followers of Jesus found joy and peace. One such person was Pastor Sunday Gomna. His Baptist church was attacked by Muslim extremists who burnt the church building and his personal residence. On the second Sunday after the violent outbreak, when the people of that Baptist church returned for worship, they gathered in a little mud wall community center about one kilometer from the burnt church. Pastor Gomna stood up and offered some beautiful words of gratitude and joy. He said, first, I'm grateful that no one in my church killed anyone. You see, apparently during the chaos of the attacks, Pastor Sunday had gone around the community and some of his Muslim friends had said, Pastor, thank you for the way you taught your people. Your people helped to protect us. So Pastor Sunday was proud that his people had actually stood up to protect Muslims. Second, he said, I'm grateful that they did not burn my church. Well, everyone looked at Pastor Sunday with disbelief. After all, there they were, meeting in a small, uncomfortable mud building because their own building had been burnt to the ground. But Pastor Sunday continued, Inasmuch as no church member died during this crisis, they did not burn our church. They only burned the building. We can rebuild the building, but we couldn't bring back to life our members who had been slaughtered. So I'm grateful they did not burn my church. He continued, third, I'm grateful that they burned my house as well. For if they had burned your house and not my house, how would I have known how to serve you as a pastor? However, because they burned my house and all my possessions, I know what others are experiencing and I will be able to be a better pastor to you. So I'm grateful that they burned my house as well. In the middle of a horrible trial, Pastor Sunday Gomna found joy through gratitude. So here's what that means for us. Gratitude turns whatever you have into enough, but grumbling turns whatever is enough into misery. That's why the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 6, 9, enjoy what you have rather than desiring what you don't have. Just dreaming about nice things is meaningless, like chasing the wind. And when you choose gratitude as your attitude, you'll have the joy that gives you the strength to walk daily in God's presence. That's the promise found in Psalm 56, 9 to 13. This I know, David said, God is on my side. I praise God for what he has promised. Yes, I praise the Lord for what he has promised. I trust in God, so why should I be afraid? What can mere mortals do to me? I will fulfill my vows to you, O God, and I will offer a sacrifice of thanks for your help, for you've rescued my soul from death. You've kept my feet from slipping. So now I can walk in your presence, O oh God, in your life giving light. And I declare to you today, you will be strong in your soul. You will be able to walk in God's presence and in his life-giving light when you offer gratitude and praise to him. Your soul will go stronger as your joy goes deeper. And that brings us to the third step to a joyful soul. Joy is a process, not a destination. Listen to how today's Christmas story ends in Luke 2.20. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. 
And think about what this means. They went back to the same old dirty pasture. They went back to the same sheep, the same job, the same place in the middle of the night. There was no visible change in their circumstances, but there was a visible change in them. The shepherds were now glorifying God and praising God. They were grateful. They were worshipful. They were back in the same old place with a new spirit of praise. And what this means is that they'd started on the journey of joy. Joy wasn't a destination for the shepherds. Joy wasn't a place they were searching for. It was a journey. It was a process that began with knowing Jesus. It was a process that continued with choices of gratitude. And it was a process that would lead them to play a significant role in the greatest story ever told, the story of Christmas. And that's how it is for all of us. Joy is a process for you, not a destination. Joy is a journey that begins when you come to recognize and worship Jesus as Lord. It continues as you choose gratitude over grumbling. That's why joy is a fruit. It has to be cultivated and grown. For Galatians 5.22 says, the fruit of the Spirit is joy. So hear me well today. Even in the wilderness you can grow joy. Even in the desert and the parched place, you can rejoice. And when you cultivate joy and grow it like a fruit, it will produce a mighty harvest in your life. That's why God tells us in Isaiah 35, 1 and 2, the desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. So listen carefully, friends. It's the desert that finds joy. The parched land becomes joyful. The wilderness rejoices and blossoms. No matter where you are, no matter what your circumstances look like, you can find and grow joy. And I speak joy to your desert places today in the name of Jesus. No matter what you're passing through, no matter what you're in today, I speak joy to you that even in the desert place, even in the parched land, even in the wilderness, God is going to bring forth joy when you begin to praise him, if you'll lift up your hands and celebrate Jesus today, you're going to experience a revival of joy. You're going to experience a revival of his presence, and you're going to endure that difficult trial and come out stronger. You're going to blossom like the crocus and grow flowers in the wilderness, and people will come and be amazed at what God has done for you. If you believe it, say, I receive it in Jesus' name. See, friends, the fact is your joy can grow when you control your soul. You have the power to tell your soul what to do. That's why over and over in Psalms, David gives directions to his soul. Listen to how he does that in Psalm 116, 7 to 9. Be at rest once more, O my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, O Lord, have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Understand that David commands his soul to be at rest and starts to remind his soul of all the good things that God has done for him. So it is for you. When your soul needs joy or peace, command your soul to listen. Begin to remind your soul of all that God has done for you. David has another conversation with his soul in Psalm 42, 11, when he wrote, Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. And here David asks his soul a question, and then he commands his soul. Soul, I command you to hope in God. Soul, I command you to praise him. And friends, in order to grow joy, you have to speak to your soul. When something doesn't go well, or you face a problem, or you're betrayed, or you're tempted to complain, you have to start talking to your soul. Say to your soul, soul, stop complaining. Soul, start praising God. Soul, remember what God has done for you. Because sometimes God puts you in the desert and the wilderness to help you refocus on him. Sometimes God puts you in the parched land to teach you to control your soul and rejoice in Christ and Christ alone. For the fact is, sometimes we have to experience loss so that we can experience gain. 
Sometimes we have to grow our joy in the soil of adversity. Sometimes God lets us go through experiences so that we'll learn to be grateful for what we have. Sometimes he sees that our soul is getting too tied to earthly things. So he takes away everything till Christ is all we have. And it's then that we'll realize Christ is all we need. For until Christ is all you have, you won't realize that Christ is all you need. That's the lesson we can learn from an American man named Horatio Spafford. Spafford was a wealthy and successful lawyer living in Chicago, USA. He and his wife, Anna, were devout Christians. But in 1871, they experienced a devastating loss when a fire swept through their city and destroyed much of their property. The Spaffords suffered a huge financial loss. So Horatio put his wife Anna and his four daughters on a ship to sail across the ocean to England. He hoped that a holiday in England would help them forget their loss and bring them rest. But as their ship sailed across the Atlantic, it was involved in an accident and sank to the bottom. All four of Spafford's daughters were drowned. Only his wife, Anna, survived. With a heavy heart of grief, Horatio quickly got on another boat and set out to meet Anna in England. He could have been overwhelmed with sorrow. He could have turned against God. But as Horatio Spafford passed the very spot in the ocean where his daughters had drowned, he sat down and wrote a hymn of praise to God. It's a hymn we still sing today, a hymn entitled, It Is Well With My Soul. Listen to the words Horatio Spafford wrote as he passed the place where his daughters died. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. In the face of human loss, Horatio Spafford gave praise to God. He spoke to his soul and declared, it is well. He did what the Bible says David did in 1 Samuel 36. David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And I don't know what trouble you're passing through today. I don't know the sorrow in your heart, but I know this. You can possess a joyful soul no matter how hard your trials. You can be filled with a supernatural joy no matter how deep the pain. You can trade your sorrows for the joy of the Lord. It all begins by realizing that joy comes from God, not circumstances. You can have a deep, abiding joy that nothing can take from you when you learn to let your soul abide in Christ. Then you have to develop an attitude of gratitude. Remember, joyful people don't become grateful. Grateful people become joyful. And finally, grow joy when you take control of your soul. Speak to your soul. Tell your soul to praise God no matter what. For when you do, you'll have joy. You'll have strength inside you that will keep you standing when all else fails. You'll be able to stand and say with David in Psalm 34, 1 to 4, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. You can experience true joy this Christmas. In fact, you can experience true joy all through the new year when you discover the source of joy. Joy doesn't come from your circumstances. It comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ. When you get to know Jesus, you get to know joy. That's why I can say boldly that joy doesn't come by chance. It comes by choice. You can choose joy, choose to be grateful, choose to rejoice, choose to see that God can work it for good in any and every situation. And remember, joy is a process, not a destination. The shepherds went back to the same field and the same circumstances that they left when they went to see baby Jesus. Nothing had changed outwardly, but they had changed inwardly. They were full of joy because they had begun the journey of joy. They'd gone to meet Jesus and had been transformed. And you can too. 
You can meet the Savior this Christmas and begin the journey to joy when you discover the source of joy in Jesus. Almighty and everlasting Father, I pray for each and every one watching and listening today. Lord, I ask you to penetrate through the dark night for those stuck in a field outside of Bethlehem, for those in a boring, difficult, painful life. I pray right now that they will see that joy comes not from circumstances, but from relationship. Open our hearts and minds to see you, to know you, to receive you. Lord, we make a choice today, a choice to praise you in the midst of everything, a choice to recognize your goodness in our life. We make that choice, Lord, to begin the journey of joy, to let it grow, and we command our souls, praise him, praise him, Praise Him all the days and experience a joy that comes from you. Father, we thank you now. Seal up the seed of your word in our hearts and let it bring forth fruit for your glory. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen and amen. May God bless you and fill your heart with joy.